through by e f benson through richard waghorn was among the cleverest and most popular of professional mediums and a never-failing source of consolation to the credulous that there was fraud downright unadulterated fraud mixed up with his remarkable manifestations it would be impossible to deny but it would have been futile not to admit that these manifestations were not wholly fraudulent he had to an extraordinary degree that rare and inexplicable gift of tapping so to speak not only the surface consciousness of those who consulted him but in favourable circumstances their inner or subliminal selves so that it frequently happened that he could speak to an inquirer of something he had completely forgotten which subsequent investigation proved to be authentic so much was perfectly genuine but he gave as it were a false frame to it all by the manner in which he presented these phenomena he pretended at his seances to go into a trance during which he was controlled sometimes by the spirit of an ancient egyptian priest who gave news to the inquirer about some dead friend or relative sometimes more directly by that dead friend or relative who spoke through him as a matter of fact waghorn would not be in a trance at all but perfectly conscious extracting as he sat quiescent and with closed eyes the knowledge remembered or even forgotten that lurked in the mind of his sitter and bringing it out in the speech of mentu the egyptian control or of the lost friend or relative about whom inquiry was being made fraudulent also as purporting to come from the intelligence of discarnate spirits were the pieces of information he gave as to the conditions under which those who had passed over still lived and it was here that he chiefly brought consolation to the credulous for he represented the dead as happy and busy and full of spiritual activities this information to speak frankly he obtained entirely from his own conscious mind he made it up and we cannot really find an excuse for him in the undoubted fact that he sincerely believed in the general truth of all he said when he spoke of the survival of individual personality finally deeply dyed with fraud and that in crude garish colours were the spirit wrappings the playing of musical boxes the appearance of materialised spirits the smell of incense that heralded cardinal newman all that bag of conjuring tricks in fact which disgraces and makes a laughing stock of the impostors who profess to be able to bring the seen world into connection with the unseen world but to do waghorn justice he did not often employ those crude contrivances for his telepathic and thought-reading gifts were far more convincing to his sitters occasionally however his powers in this line used to fail him and then it must be confessed he presented his egyptian control with every trapping and circumstance of degrading device such was the general scheme of procedure when richard waghorn with his sister as accomplice in case mechanical tricks were necessary undertook to reveal the spirit world to the material world they were a pleasant handsome pair of young people gifted with a manner that if anything disarmed suspicion too much and while feudal old gentlemen found it quite agreeable to sit in the dark holding julia's firm cool hand similarly constituted old ladies were the recipients of thrilling emotions when they held richards the touch of which they declared was strangely electric there they sat while richard breathing deeply and moaning in his simulated trance was the mouthpiece of mentu and told them things which but for his indubitable gift of thought-reading it was impossible for him to know 
or if the power was not coming through properly they listened hardly less thrilled to spirit rappings and musical boxes and unverifiable information about the conditions of life where the mortal coil hampers no longer it was all very interesting and soothing and edifying and then one day there occurred an eruption of something wholly unexpected and inexplicable brother and sister were dining quietly after a busy but unsatisfactory day when the tinkling summons came from the telephone and richard found that a loud voice belonging so it said to mrs gardiner wanted to arrange a sitting alone for next day no address was given but he made an appointment for half-past two and without much enthusiasm went back to his dinner a stranger he said to his sister with no address and no reference or introduction i hope i shall be in better form to-morrow there was nothing but rappings and music to-day they are boring and also they are dangerous for one may be detected at any time and i got an infernal blow on my knuckles from that new electric tapper julia laughed i know i heard it she said there was quite wrong noise in one of the taps as we were spelling out silver wing he lit his cigarette frowning at the smoke that's the worst of my profession he said on some days i can get quite right inside the mind of the sitter and as you know bring out the most surprising information but on other days to-day for instance and there have been many such lately there's a mere blank wall in front of me i shall lose my position if it happens often nobody will pay my fees only to hear spirit rappings and generalities they're better than nothing said julia very little they help to fill up but i hate using them don't you remember when we began investigating just you and i alone how often we seemed on the verge of genuine supernatural manifestations they appeared to be just round the corner yes but we never turned the corner we never got beyond mere thought reading he got up i know we didn't but there always seemed a possibility the door was ajar it wasn't locked and it has never ceased to be ajar often when the mere thought reading as you call it is flowing along most smoothly i feel that if only i could abandon my whole consciousness a little more completely something somebody would really take control of me i wish it would and yet i'm frightened of it it might revenge itself for all the frauds i've perpetrated in its name come let's play piquet and forget about it all it was settled that julia should be present next day when the stranger came for her sitting in order that if richard's thought reading was not coming through any better than it had done lately she should help in the wrappings and the luminous patches and the musical box mrs gardiner was punctual to her appointment tall quiet well-dressed woman who stated with the perfect frankness her object in wishing for a seance and her views about spirit communication i should immensely like to believe in spirit communication she said such as i am told you are capable of producing but at present i don't it is important that the atmosphere should not be one of hostility said waghorn in his dreamy professional manner i bring no hostility she said i am in a state shall we say of benevolent neutrality unless and she smiled in a charming manner unless benevolent neutrality has come to mean malevolent hostility that i assure you is not the case with me i want to believe she paused a moment and may i say this without offence she asked may i tell you that spirit rappings and curious lights and sounds of music do not interest me in the least they were already seated in the room where the seance was to be held the windows were thickly curtained there was only a glimmer of light from the red lamp and even this the spirits would very likely desire to have extinguished 
if this visitor took no interest in such things waghorn felt that he and his sister had wasted their time in adjusting the electric hammer made to rap by the pressure of the foot on a switch concealed in the thick rug underneath the table behind the sliding panel in stringing across the ceiling the invisible wires on which the luminous globes ran and in making ready all the auxiliary paraphernalia in case the genuine telepathy was not on tap so with voice dreamier than before and with slower utterance as he was supposed to be beginning to sink into trance he just said i can't foretell the manner in which they may choose to make their presence known he gave one loud rap which perfectly conveyed the word no to his sister indicating that the conjuring tricks were not to be used subsequently if really necessary he could rap yes to her and the music and the magic lights would be displayed then he began to breathe quickly and in a snorting manner to show that the control was taking possession of him my brother is going into trance very quickly said julia and there was dead silence almost immediately a clear and shining lucidity spread like sunshine after these days of cloud over waghorn's brain every moment he found himself knowing more and more about this complete stranger who sat with hand touching his he felt his subconscious brain which had lately lain befogged and imperceptive sun itself under the brilliant clarity of illumination that had come to it and in the impressive bass in which mentu was wont to give vent to his revelations he said i am here mentu is here he felt the table rocking beneath his hands which surprised him since he had exerted no pressure on it and he supposed that julia had not understood his signal and was beginning the conjuring tricks one hand of his was in hers and by the pressure of his fingertips he conveyed to her in code don't do it instantly she answered back i wasn't he paid no more heed to that though the table continued to oscillate and tip in a very curious manner for his mind was steeped in this flood of images that impressed themselves on his brain what shall mentu tell you to-day he went on with pauses between the sentences some one has come to consult mentu it is a lady i can see her she wears a locket round her neck below her coat with a piece of black hair and a glass between the gold he felt a slight jerk from mrs gardiner's hand and in fingertip code said to julia ask her julia whispered across the table is that so yes said mrs gardiner and waghorn heard her take her breath quickly he just remembered that she was not in mourning but that made no difference he knew not guessing that mrs gardiner wished to know something from the man or woman on whose head that hair once grew which was contained in the locket that rested unseen below her buttoned jacket then the next moment he knew also that this was a man's hair thereafter the flood of sun and precise mental impressions poured over him in spate of bright waters she wants to know about the boy whose hair is in the locket he is not a boy now he is according to earth's eyes a grown man there is a d i see a d not dick not david there is a y it is dennis not saint dennis not french english dennis Dennis Bristow. He paused a moment and heard Mrs. Gardiner whisper, Yes, that is right. Waghorn gave vent to Mentu's jovial laugh. She says it is right, he said. How should not Mentu be right? Perhaps Mentu is right, too, when he says that Dennis is her brother. Yes, that is Margaret Bristow who sits here though not margaret bristow now margaret 
Waghorn saw the name quite clearly, but yet he hesitated. It was not Gardner at all. Then it struck him for the first time that nothing was more likely than that Mrs. Gardner had adopted a pseudonym. He went on. Margaret Forsyth is Dennis's sister. Margaret wants to know about Dennis. Dennis is coming. He will be here in a moment. He has spoken of his sister before. He did not call her Margaret. He called her Q. He called her Queenie. Will Queenie speak? Waghorn felt the trembling of her hand. He heard her twice try to speak, but she was unable to control the trembling in her voice. Can Dennis speak to me? she said in a whisper. Can he really come here? Up to this moment Waghorn had been enjoying himself immensely, for after the days in which he had been unable to get into touch with this rare and marvellous gifts of consciousness reading, it was blissful to find his mastery again, and besieged with the images which Margaret Forsyth's contact revealed to him, he had been producing them in Mentu's impressive voice, revelling in his restored powers. Her mind lay open to him like a book. He could read where he liked on pages familiar to her, and on pages which had remained long unturned. But at this moment, as sudden as some qualm of sickness, he was aware of a startling change in the quality of his perceptions. Fresh knowledge of Dennis Bristow came into his mind, but he felt that it was not coming from her, but from some other source. Some odd buzzing sang in his ears, as when an anaesthetic begins to take effect, and opening his eyes he thought he saw a strange patch of light, inconsistent with the faint illumination of the red lamp, hovering over his breast. At the same moment he heard, though dimly, for his head was full of confused noise, the violent rapping of the electric hammer, and already only half conscious, felt an impotent irritation with his sister for employing these tricks. He struggled with the oncoming of the paralysis that was swiftly invading his mind and his physical being, but he struggled in vain and next moment, overwhelmed with the onrush of a huge enveloping blackness, he lost consciousness altogether. The trance that he had often simulated had invaded him, and he knew nothing more. He came to himself again with the feeling that he had been recalled from some vast distance. Still unable to move, he sat listening to the quick panting of his own breath before he realized what the noise was. His face, from which the sweat poured in streams, rested on something cold and hard, and presently, when he opened his eyes, he saw that his head had fallen forward upon the table. He felt utterly exhausted, and yet somehow strangely satisfied. Some amazing thing had happened. Then, as he recovered himself, he began to remember that he had been reading Mrs. Gardner's or Mrs. Forsyth's mind, when some power external to himself took possession of him, and on his left he heard Julia's voice speaking very familiar words. "'He's coming out of his trance,' she said. "'He will be himself again in a moment now.' With a sense of great weariness he raised his head, disengaged his hands from those of the two women, and sank back in his chair." "'Draw back the curtains,' he said to Julia, "'and open the window. I'm suffocating.' She did as he told her, and he saw the red rays of the sun near to its setting pour into the room while the breeze of sunset refreshed the air. On his right still sat Mrs. Forsyth, wiping her eyes and smiling at him, and having opened the window, Julia came back to the table, looking at him with a curious, anxious intentness. Then Mrs. Forsyth spoke. "'It has been too marvellous,' she said. "'I cannot thank you enough. I will do exactly as you, or rather Dennis, told me about the test, and if it is right, I will certainly leave my house to-morrow, taking my servants with me. It was so like Dennis to think of them, too.' 
to waghorn this meant nothing whatever she might have been speaking hebrew to him but julia as she often did answered for him my brother knows nothing of what happened in his trance she said mrs forsythe got up i will go straight home she said i feel sure that i shall find just what dennis described may i telephone to you about it at once yes pray do said julia we shall be most anxious to hear richard got up to show her out but having regained his feet he staggered and collapsed into his chair again mrs forsythe would not hear of his attempting to move just yet and julia having taken her to the door returned to her brother it was usual for him when the sitting was over to feign great exhaustion but the realism of his acting to-day had almost deceived her into thinking that something not yet experienced in their seances had occurred besides he had said such strange detailed and extraordinary things he was still where she had left him and there could be no reason now that they were alone to keep up this feigned languor dick she said what's the matter and what happened i couldn't understand you at all why did you say all those things he stirred and sat up i'm better he said and it is you who have to tell me what happened. I remember up to a certain point, and after that I lost consciousness completely. I remember thinking you were rocking the table, and I told you not to. Yes, but I wasn't rocking it. I thought you were. Well, it was neither of us then, said he. I was vexed because Mrs. Gardner, Mrs. Forsythe, had said she didn't want that sort of thing, and I was reading her as I never read any one before. I told her about the locket and the black hair. I got her brother's name. I got her name and her nickname Queenie. Then she asked if Dennis could really come, and at that moment something began to take possession of me. I think I saw a light as usual over my breast, and I think I heard a tremendous rapping. Did you do either of those, or did they really happen? Julia stared at him for a moment in silence. I did neither of those, she said, but they happened. You must have pressed the breast pocket switch and trod on the switch of the hammer. He opened his coat. I had not got the breast pocket switch, he said and I certainly did not tread on the hammer switch. Julia moved her chair a little closer to him. The hammer did not sound right, she said. It was ten times louder than I've ever heard, and the light was quite different somehow. It was much brighter. I could see everything in the room quite distinctly. Go on, Dick. I can't. That's all I know until I came to, leaning over the table and bathed in perspiration. Tell me what happened. Dick, do you swear that it's true? she asked. Certainly I do. Go on. The light grew, and then faded again to a glimmer, she said. And then suddenly you began to talk in a different voice. It wasn't meant to any longer. Mrs. Forsythe recognized it instantly, and I thought what wonderful luck it was that you should have hit on a voice that was like her brother's. Then it and she had a long talk. It must have lasted half an hour. They reminded each other how Dennis had come to live with her and her husband on their father's death. He was only eighteen at the time and still at school. He was killed in a street accident, being run over by a bicycle two days before her birthday. All this was correct, and I thought I never heard you mind reading so clearly and quickly. You hardly paused at all. Julia was silent a moment. Dick, don't you really know what followed? she asked. Not in the smallest degree, he said. Well, I thought you had gone mad, she said. Mrs. Forsythe asked for a test, something that was not known to her and had never been known to her, and you gave it instantly. 
you laughed dennis laughed the voice that spoke laughed and told her to look behind the row of books beside the bed in the room that was still known as dennis's room and she would find tucked away a little cardboard box with a gold safety pin set with a pearl he had bought it for her birthday present and had hidden it there till the day came he was killed as i told you two days before and she half sobbing half laughing said oh dennis how deliciously secretive you used to be and is that what she's going to telephone about asked waghorn yes dick what made you say all that i didn't know i tell you i didn't know i said it and was that all she said something about leaving her house tomorrow and taking the servants what did that mean you got very much distressed you told her she was in danger you said julia paused again you said there was something coming fire from the clouds and a rending you said her country house which i gathered was down somewhere near epping would be burst open by the fire from the clouds to-morrow night you made her promise to leave it and take the servants with her you said her husband was away which again is the case and she asked if you meant zeppelins and you said you did waghorn suddenly got up you meant you said you did he cried what if it's he meant he said he did it's impossible she said good lord what's impossible he asked what if i really am that which i have so long pretended to be what if i am a medium one who is the mysterious bridge between the quick and the dead i'm frightened but i'm bound to say i'm horribly interested all that you tell me i said when i was in a trance never came out of mrs forsyth's mind it wasn't there she didn't know about the pearl pin she had never known it nor had i ever known it where did it come from then only one person knew the boy who died ten years ago it yet remains to be seen whether it is true said she we shall know in an hour or two for she is motoring straight down to her house in the country and if it turns out to be true who was talking said he the sunset faded into the dusk of the clear may evening and the two still sat there waiting for the telephone to inform them whether the door which as waghorn had said had seemed so often ajar and never quite closed was now thrown open and light and intelligence from another world had shone on his unconscious mind presently the tinkling summons came and with an eager curiosity below which lurked that fear of the unknown the dim mysterious land into which all human creatures pass across the closed frontier he went to hear what news awaited him trunk call said the operator and he listened soon the voice came through mr waghorn it said yes i have found the box and exactly the place described it contained what we had been told it would contain i shall leave the house taking all the servants away to-morrow two mornings later the papers contained news of a zeppelin raid during the night on certain eastern counties the details given were vague and meagre and no names of towns or villages where bombs had been dropped were vouchsafed to the public but later in the day private information came to waghorn that forsyth hall near epping had been completely wrecked no lives luckily were lost for the house was empty End of section 11